My name is Alana Lee and I exhibited at SciFest in 2013 and 2014. Since then I've continued to follow my passion for science and I hope that by sharing some of my experiences with you I can open your mind to some of the opportunities that are out there for people who want to explore the natural world. After finishing the Leaving Cert I studied natural sciences through correspondence with the Open University. Distance learning is more common now because of COVID-19 but at the time it was unusual. I did get the opportunity to work as a researcher at the Open University while I was studying and being involved in the Earth and Vision project was my first time being a part of an interdisciplinary academic team. Earth and Vision is a digital humanities project that was developed by the Open University and it explores natural history broadcasting archival footage. Examining broadcasting archives can tell us more about our relationship with the natural world and that's why we were doing that type of research. So we developed narratives around this and we published our findings in a series of ebooks. And one of the most exciting things about working on this project was the fact that David Attenborough was collaborating directly with the Earth and Vision project and he was really invested in bringing archival information and old broadcasting footage to the public by using new digital means. So it was a fantastic experience. The lemurs, with their fox-like faces and their human-like hands and feet, belong to the group of primates, the group which contains monkeys, apes and man himself. But the lemurs are more primitive than any of these other families and appeared much earlier in geological history. After working on the Earth and Vision project, I was eager to work with wildlife in the field again. So I travelled to Malta to volunteer with BirdLife International. Malta is a strategic location for migrating birds. You can see where it's situated there between uh, northeastern Africa and the south of Italy. So birds as they're migrating, that's a fantastic place for them to um, stock up on food for them to recover from the journeys that they're making and it increases their chances of making a successful migration. But that just hasn't been the case given the way that illegal hunting in Malta is going. Um, it's been detrimental um, to global bird populations and it remains one of the greatest issues faced by BirdLife Malta in their conservation efforts. So the bird in the bottom right corner, that's a greater flamingo, you're probably familiar with those already. Um, this one is white because it's a juvenile. They gain their pink colour from uh, pigment that's found in the algae uh, where they feed and in the invertebrates that they feed on. They're an absolutely stunning species. This is my first time seeing one while I was there. Um, I was at Gadira Nature Reserve. Um, and this bird, this individual, had been shot illegally by hunters. It had been rehabilitated by the volunteers at BirdLife International and then shot a second time and had to be rehabilitated a second time. This, it's just absolutely astonishing some of the damage that's done there. While I was in Malta, I worked closely with um, the wardens that were over there at the designated nature reserves. Um, I was assisting with bird counts. So I did that at Selina Nature Reserve with uh, Nimrod Mifsud. He is the warden there and actually in 2018 he won a Nature Heroes Award for some of the work that he's been doing. Um, he's been volunteering for years over there. He's doing fantastic work. And I also assisted with bird counts at um, Camino Island with um, Timothy Mikalef. So the people who are working within BirdLife Malta over there, they, they're incredibly resilient. Um, like they just they work tirelessly to improve the conditions on the island and combat the effects of illegal hunting. The training that they receive is very different to what we would be doing over here in Ireland because they're putting themselves at risk. Um, quite often they have to intervene where there's altercations um, like Nimrod was telling me about uh, situations where he's seen hunters killing booted eagles 
putting them into the backs of their cars and he's had to go and intervene and try to recover injured birds that could potentially um, be rehabilitated and reintroduced to the wild. So they are putting themselves very much in harm's way um, to help the populations recover. MOLSA was the first international conservation project that I had been involved with. Um, it was fantastic because it opened my mind up to some of the greater issues that were at play that were affecting wildlife on a global level. So this paved the way for me to go on and volunteer as a warden with the Department of Conservation in Sandfly Bay in New Zealand and the South Island. So at this site there are two key species that were receiving a lot of um, protection and monitoring. So one was the yellow-eyed penguin which you just saw in the last slide and the other is the New Zealand sea lion. So New Zealand has seven extant endemic penguin species and by endemic um, we mean native because there's also invasive species in New Zealand that cause threats for the native wildlife there. Um, at least five of those seven species have been sighted at Sandfly Bay but the yellow-eyed penguins actually have an established breeding colony and they're also known as hoiho which is the Maori word for um, yellow-eyed penguin. The Maori people are the indigenous people of New Zealand and their culture and heritage is intertwined with the nature of New Zealand. And respecting and understanding their values is a crucial part um, of successful conservation and acknowledging the values and, and the beliefs of indigenous people is, is always important to conservation as a whole. Now the New Zealand sea lion, it's the rarest species of sea lion, but it's also one of the smaller species. And that's quite interesting because they are evolved from the individuals that were displaced from the Antarctic and subantarctic by larger sea lions in those habitats. And they eventually were separated long enough to become their own species. And you see a lot with the wildlife in this area in the South Island of New Zealand, that it's really closely linked to the biodiversity of the sub-Antarctic and the Antarctic as well. So these are some of the challenges faced by Sandfly Bay's wildlife. Invasive predators, so those are introduced predators like stoats, weasels and even hedgehogs, they can all threaten New Zealand's native species and if left uncontrolled could outcompete them. Um, Human fishing activities, so some of the sea lions coming ashore at Sandfly Bay, you actually often see bullet wounds on them. That's from fishermen um, shooting at them when they're interfering with fishing and nets. Human disturbance and tourist activity is a really significant challenge for the wildlife at Sandfly Bay, especially the penguins. Um, sea lions are generally more expressive in feeling encroached upon or if they're feeling stressed, they'll actually lash out um, at tourists that get too close. But penguins don't, they just stand really still. And that's what happened to this snares crested penguin. Um, he did survive. So this penguin had come ashore um, to molt at Sandfly Bay. And you can see the feathers starting to come off um, on his back there. And when penguins go through a molt, they're not able to hunt for up to eight weeks. So they have to have enough fat stores to get themselves um, through that period. And this penguin did when he first came ashore, but he used those reserves up um, in the stress that he was experiencing by being um, bombarded by tourists. So we had to intervene and take him to the Yellow-Eyed Penguin Trust um, where he was um, taken to a sanctuary and rehydrated, otherwise he was actually going to die. And that's really unfortunate um, because these birds should be able to come ashore and display their natural behaviour and enjoy the habitat. And then rising sea temperatures has led to penguins being exposed to new pathogens. In the mid-2000s, the um, reproductive rates at Sandfly Bay for yellow-eyed penguins was really poor and that was actually because of a new pathogen that they were being exposed to. They think that it could have been avian diphtheria. Uh, it was leading to a lot of the chicks dying and not being able to be fed. Um, and normally these birds they wouldn't be exposed to these types of pathogens because the water around New Zealand is too cold and um, so this is one of the effects of climate change that maybe we don't think about a lot or is a lot more difficult to anticipate. In September of last year, I had probably one of the most exciting opportunities that I'd ever had kind of present itself. 
um, where I kind of there was a prospect of uh, crossing the Pacific Ocean. I had been doing some sailing in New Zealand, um, and a friend of mine who has built his career around um, expedition sailing, um, he has taken scientists to the subantarctic, and he was due to deliver a boat from um, French Polynesia to the Galapagos and needed crew. Um, so needless to say, I was really enthusiastic to do that. So we, with a crew of three, um, and it was a 70 foot um, functional power boat, um, which was designed in New Zealand and um, the captain of the vessel was involved in the design process as well. So it was a fantastic opportunity to learn not only about sailing, but about the um, engineering aspects of um, designing the boat as well. Um, so there was a crew of three. It took us 16 days. Um, we covered 3,000 nautical miles and we were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, thousands of miles from land in every direction. It was one of the most uh, compelling, exhilarating and addictive experiences you could possibly imagine. Um, so much so that I crossed the Pacific again later on that year <laughs> um, on a different vessel. So ended up spending, you know, 7,000 nautical miles at sea this year, which is absolutely fantastic. As soon as I arrived um, in the Galapagos, I got involved with the Charles Darwin Foundation. I started to volunteer um, at first with the marine collection. The marine collection for the Charles Darwin Research Station is one of the four natural history collections at the Foundation and it's home to more than 7,000 specimens representing the wide diversity of the Galapagos Marine Reserve and these specimens are kept in controlled conditions and they're preserved so that other scientists can come and study them and they're an essential part of telling the story of the archipelago. If you look at the bottom right corner of that picture you can see uh, there is Lennon Bantacourt at the front. He is the curator of the marine collection for the Charles Darwin Foundation. Um, he was our supervisor. Um, the second person in that photograph is Gregory Caswell, who was volunteering in the collection around the same time as myself. And that day we were on our way to the National Geographic Islander exploration vessel to uh, deliver a talk about our research and what was happening within the marine collection for the Charles Darwin Foundation, which was absolutely fantastic. When volunteering at the Charles Darwin Foundation, we were encouraged to find an area of research that interested us and to try to um, develop a publication from that. So. The first thing that I did was started looking at the data that we did have for species um, within the marine collection and tried to find areas where there was a lack of knowledge. Um, and immediately cephalopods were a group that were obviously understudied. Um, so then it was down to trying to find out why. So I looked to the literature, which there wasn't an awful lot of, and that was another indication that this was an area that probably needed a little bit more attention. Um, and I learned very quickly that it is difficult to capture cephalopods um, and that it is a really difficult area taxonomically as well. Um, so I started looking through the collection at some of the specimens that were unidentified um, and kind of one of my research objectives was to try to identify one of these species and the specimen that stood out was a specimen that was gathered in 2015 um, during an expedition of sea mounts. Um, it turned out to be a deep sea uh, benthic octopod and that's what I'm focusing my research on at the moment. So this specimen was gathered at a depth of 1800 metres um, during a 2015 expedition. So that is far outside the photic zone. Um, this species probably lives its life in complete darkness um, under immense crushing pressures in the deep sea. And the reality is we know very little about it. And identifying these species is a crucial step to understanding the biodiversity that we have in our deep seas globally. Um, 
our deep seas are immensely understudied but the discovery of diverse life um, at those depths was completely unprecedented and it's still a developing area it's essentially the final frontier of planet earth so to be able to contribute to that in any way um, even trying to get an identification for this specimen would be absolutely fantastic so these are the first steps to try to identify what taxonomic group the specimen could belong to. Um, there are taxonomic experts in every area. Um, it's a very meticulous field and it's not something that I have a huge amount of experience in. So the first thing that I did was contacted the expert in the field and that's Dr. Janet Voigt of the Chicago Field Museum. And I continued to kind of consult the literature on the topic as well. Um, so from being in correspondence with Janet and also from reading as many of her publications and other influential scientists in the field, um, we started to learn what traits we need to look at to try to identify this octopus. So in the first image is the octopus's beak. Now these have all been placed under a microscope so they are magnified. So this here is what the octopus uses to eat its prey um, and it's actually fantastic that we were able to see that at all. Um, this is the pigmentation so octopoda in general they can come in all different kinds of translucencies and colours so you can see very clear pigment here and the, the specimen doesn't appear to be translucent. Um, we're going to take lots of traits from the arms as well um, so I've been measuring those in the past few weeks and passing them on to the taxonomic expert to try to gain as much um, knowledge as we can and the suckers as well so we call these uh, like uniserial suck suckers so there's, there's just one row of suckers there so that was um, a, quite a, an obvious determining feature from the beginning and we're continuing to work on this and it's something that will continue to develop and hopefully we will be able to get some kind of taxonomic information and after that we would like to possibly press forward with some genetic testing too. So here are some of the new records that we've been able to include in um, the octopoda that we know are present here in the Galapagos. This is Halophon atlanticus, it's a deep sea species um, really gelatinous texture. There's been reports of when these guys are recovered that they just fill the space of the vessel that they're put in. So they're not very muscular at all. You can only really imagine what they're like. This is granulodome. So we would expect that this could be a genus that is quite closely related to the unidentified specimen that we're working with. Um, this down here is thomelodome. We think that the specimen we have could be in the genus Thomelodon and potentially a new species, or it could belong to one of the six species that we have within the genus of Thomelodon. This is Grimpotuthus. This is a serrate octopod, so that means that these guys have fins. So in terms of their evolution, these guys are older. They're more what we call a basal species, so they've been around for longer. This is another serrate octopod. That guy there is Cerothauma. And here we have Callist octopus. So you can see there that in the short space of time that we have been um, exploring the deep sea in Galapagos, there's already a whole new wealth of biodiversity coming to life my time volunteering at the Charles Darwin Foundation. Both myself and uh, marine biologist Maggie Mossbrooker from the Foundation um, joined the Tacatrace research vessel as onboard scientists on a passage from the Galapagos to French Polynesia. So we travelled 4,000 nautical miles back across the Pacific and as we were doing that we gathered offshore biological data. So I was looking at uh, gathering some data on squid and Maggie was gathering data on some species of flying fish as well. So we're hoping to upload this data to um, an online resource called OBIS where other scientists will be able to use it hopefully in the future.
Thank you all very much for listening to my talk. I hope that this is helpful in some ways and that seeing the opportunities that are out there for young scientists encourages you all to keep exploring. It's not an easy career path in a lot of ways because it's not linear, um, but never be afraid to follow your curiosity. Keep doing the things that you're passionate about and keep seeking opportunities because they will always be there. There's lots of challenges from funding to proving that young scientists can do valuable work, but with uh, the up and coming scientists that I'm sure are coming through SciFest at the moment, um, the world is going to be a better and brighter place for all of your contribution to science. So I wish you all the very best of luck and thank you for listening to my experiences.